So holy God, we pray. It's not my words, but yours that we hear. And not our imaginations, God, but yours. Not our planting and growing even, God, but yours. So God, be with us here and speak here, we pray, for your people want to listen. It's in your name we pray and everyone says, amen. So we have journeyed through this past month that we've been calling Earth Month. We have journeyed most of this month in the book of Genesis, thinking and talking about our creation. We've considered some of the connections between resurrection and our approach to earth care, remembering that the real and the physical is as sacred as the spiritual. We've remembered what it is that we are from, the very dust of the ground, the dust of creation, and that we are from specific places and pieces of creation that we are called to learn about more deeply so that we can love them more deeply. We've remembered what it is we are for, which, as our text tells us, is to serve and preserve the garden and to wonder, to marvel, to lean into the mystery that creation finds a way to reveal that lets us draw closer to our creator. And so today, to conclude this month that we have spent together, we are jumping to the end. Our scripture reading today comes from the last book of our Bible, our book of both apocalypse and prophecy, the letter of Revelation. So the imagery of this book comes from the author, a man we know as John of Patmos, as he hides in exile on an island and writes an account of accusation against the empire of his day, the Roman Empire, wrapped in imagery and illustration to keep it hidden from that empire. And so from Revelation chapter 21, we read, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, See, the home of God is among mortals. God will dwell with them, and they will be God's people. And God's self will be with them. God will wipe away every tear from their eye. And death will be no more. Mourning and crying and pain will be no more. For the first things have passed away. And the one who was seated on the throne said, See, I am making all things new. This is the word of our Lord. Thanks be to God. This piece of text is responsible for the comfort of so many, myself included. In times of grief or stress, the faithful have held tight to this promise that God dwells and will dwell with the people that God will wipe away every tear from every eye. But this text is also what more modern Christians have used to do some damage to the efforts of environmental protection and e ecological theology as a whole. Why, some contend, why do we need to care about this planet here and now if our text tells us that a new one is on the way? Shouldn't we strive first for the kingdom of God? Let this one be what it is. Shouldn't we focus not on what is perishable, but the imperishable? A new heaven, a new earth, surely that's what matters. It's pretty terrible theology and makes for even worse policy. God's promise that it gets better does not negate our call to make it better here and now. It's that desire to make it 
in whatever way we can a little bit better, has led us to do some of the things that we have done in this month together. It's what led some of us to learn an awful lot about worms yesterday. I'm quite embarrassed by this, really, about how little I knew about worms. I've been in school basically my entire life. I've learned from some of the smartest people on this planet, and I did not know about the essential nitrogen in worm poop. I didn't know that the reason worms crawl onto the sidewalk when the pressure changes before a rain is so that they won't drown under the ground. Did you know that? We learned quite a bit yesterday in our worm bin workshop out here in our garden. Lori Caldwell, a worm bin, worm bin workshop leader from Stop Waste, she led us in learning, and she did so with incredible patience while our adult minds were blown and our children kept raising their hands, most of them asking questions related to, do we get to play with the worms now? Patience is hard for kids, and it's hard for us, too. Lori told us that we wouldn't be harvesting our worm poop. Okay, it's called worm casings, but it's poop. Can I say poop? We wouldn't be harvesting our worm poop for three to four months, and I could feel the tension rising in all of us as we realized we had to feed these little creatures in these bins we had made for three to four months before we could start harvesting the things that will help all of our plants grow. Nature is this way. It draws us into the waiting. I trust our text as much as I trust the worms that I am now feeding. And so I trust that there will come a day when we experience something like a new heaven and a new earth. And I trust that the kind of waiting we are called to do here is not passive. We are to wait, but the worms need fed, and the garden needs tended. There will be a day when our patience and our pain will be relieved, when the struggle will be no more. And until that day, the tears need to be wiped away, and all that causes God's children to cry must be fought with, with all of our might. The patience that we are called to as people of faith is never passive. The new that is coming will not dispose of the old. We must tend what is ours to tend, serve and preserve here and now, all while holding tight to the hope of what will be. And this brings me to our seed pots. I confess to you in an email a few weeks ago, that my patience for our little pot came undone. My son had been faithfully watering this little pot. I was moving it around, making sure it was getting the right amounts of sun. But after a couple of weeks of no sign of growth, I dumped out the pot to realize that there was no seed inside. If that's not parenthood and literally a pot in a nutshell, I don't know what it is. I wrote in that email that I was planning to sneak a seed in, not wanting my child to become disenchanted with the idea of growing things if nothing ever grows. But I decided not to sneak it in and instead show him that we needed to put a seed inside. But oddly, he confused me. He protested when I tried to do so, and he told me, no, the seeds go in the dirt. Now, conversing with a two-year-old uh, is an exercise in interpretation, but after some back and forth, I realized that he was telling me, I think that his seed was not in the pot, something that he knew, because it was with the other seeds in the big pot of dirt. I can't entirely be sure, but I think that this is what he means. If you remember, at the start of this month, we had some bowls out that looked like this on the tables that you scooped your dirt out of to make your own tiny seed pots. Well, the kids that Sunday, I later realized, took all the seeds, 
that were left over and dumped them into the dirt. And rather than trying to fish each one out, I decided to just leave them in there and water them as is. And as you can see, they've done remarkably better than mine did at home. We've had these in the sacristy for the past month. I've been watering and letting them have some sun in there. It never occurred to me, though, that the kids did this intentionally. I thought they were just being silly and maybe uh, a bit feisty and dumping the things around before they walked out. But apparently, my own child knew that his little pot was empty because he put his seed with the other seeds in the big dirt. So I have suggested throughout this series that kids often get these things right. They get this relationship with both our planet and our God a little more right than the rest of us. And I think that they get it right because their imaginations work a bit differently than ours. Our imaginations tend to get a little more restricted as we age. It's because when we are young, we don't know how all of it works, and so our brains have to invent the answers to things we can't figure out. Kids don't mind watering an empty pot because the growing of a new plant might as well be magic. But as we age, we learn how things work. Our brains don't need to invent so many answers. Our imaginations then become a little bit more tired, maybe. They shrink a bit. It becomes more difficult for us to imagine realities that we have never seen. I think that's why we've been captivated, as some of us have been, by the student protests happening around on our university campuses. Have you been watching this? If you've been watching, you've seen students everywhere from New York to here in California sitting down, standing up, insisting that their schools divest from companies engaged in the ongoing genocide of Gaza. Our media has been captivated, maybe as a distraction from the actual horror of all that is happening in Gaza. But also, also I think that these students are helping our imaginations. It's hard for some of us, many of us really, to see any hope in this situation, to see any possibility of our nation's leaders changing course from the one that we have been on. But then we have these students, these young people who are putting their academic lives, their futures, their bodies on the line. They're practicing the kind of peaceful protest that our academic institutions have taught them to practice for generations. And in doing so, they're showing us all a little, about, a little about what courage looks like, what faithfulness looks like. And I think they're inviting our imaginations to see another reality here, a reality where hope is not now or ever lost, a reality where kids here are connected and know that they are connected with kids dying there, they're inviting us to see another reality that requires us to be a bit more willing to put it all on the line, too. They're inviting us to see what our limited imaginations may not otherwise be able to see. If you've watched this, there are many who have been sitting peacefully, crowds of faithful Jewish students that are practicing Passover Seder meals behind makeshift barricades on campus lawns, with nothing more than tents and megaphones, they are being met by militarized police strapped with weapons of war. The images that are being shown are stark and revealing. These students with their actions are revealing both how desperately we need a new heaven and a new earth and what it looks like to not wait passively, but to work for it, to insist on it, to let our patience be filled with nothing less than protest and peace. And church, I think that here, in a different way, well, this is what we've done together in this month. That we have worked together 
to help one another imagine that more is possible here. We gathered some weeks ago, both our housed and unhoused folks, and learned a weird, beautiful Japanese tradition that combined both art and earth to make kokodama plants together. Ms. Tanya didn't like getting dirt under her nails, and if I'm honest, I didn't either. John was the fastest moss wrapper I've ever seen, and the laughter erupted in waves as none of us knew quite what we were doing. But together, a new thing was learned and made, and more so, we got a glimpse, a glimpse of something like a new heaven and a new earth. A new day when what we have matters less than what we are capable of creating together. Just a glimpse, but that glimpse is all that it takes for imaginations to grow, for us to know the new heaven and the new earth are worthy of our work here and now. And then last Sunday, over 40 of us gathered at Lake Chabot after worship, and we hiked, and Phil Arzino taught us what poison oak looks like, and the children squealed in excitement at the sight of a turtle, and then right, ran right into what probably was poison oak. And some of us walked slow, and Miles ran faster than any of us could catch him. And at least one of us, my own child, took a nap and made mom walk two miles back to the car while carrying us. And there we got a glimpse of a new heaven and a new earth, of a day when background and ability and every dividing line our culture seeks to create melts away, and we just walk and breathe and use our phones to figure out together what kind of bird makes that kind of noise. And then last Wednesday, our, at our movie theater, The Chabot, they hosted a screening of the cartoon Wally. -E. And some of you and most of our youth went to see the movie together. And in many ways, it was just a movie, but also it was another glimpse a glimpse of a new day when youth are safe and cared for and invited to imagine, listened to by adults who care for them held in community that will continue to be a safe place no matter what dangers of this world they venture into. And then here yesterday, we were here, our hands in dirt and newspaper, learning together more than we've known about worms and maybe seeking, maybe seeking with all we've got to give ourselves over to the care of tiny, slightly gross pieces of creation. And there we got a glimpse of a new heaven and a new earth, a new tomorrow when impatience to care for the smallest and slimiest parts of creation will captivate us all, when gentleness and the constant care of our tiniest creatures is a normal practice, when weapons are broken down and swords beaten into plowshares because it will make more sense to feed each other than to kill each other. And all of these, all of these are just glimpses, but when we see them together, they might be enough to remind us what we are made of and what we are made for. They're enough to remind us of who and of whose we are to expand our imaginations and to ignite our hope. They're enough to convict us of the promise that it can be better than it is, better than it has been. And if we can hold tight to that hope, hold tight to these glimpses we get, it will be enough to encourage us to keep working here and now for a new heaven and a new earth a new day when the tears that drown this world will be no more. And so church, it's that hope. It's those glimpses that we're called to remember, 
called to live as witnesses to in this earth month and all these days ahead. For this planet of ours is desperate for people who know and who live that kind of hope. Let us pray. So creating, redeeming, restoring God, God of glimpses and God of good news, God of all we pray this day in gratitude for the glimpses that you make so abundant in this place, for the work that you give us to do, and for these people, all of us, God, this community you gift us to do it with. And God, we pray this day for our children, for our students, for our young people inheriting a world that is crying out. God, we ask that you encourage them, strengthen them. God, protect them. Ignite their imaginations, hold soft their hearts, surround them with prayer and mercy. And let us be, God, and let us be a place and a people who looks to the witness of our children to find inspiration for our own imagination. Let us be a place and a people who follows you by letting our young ones lead us, who believe and practice with all of ourselves that there will be a new day and who work for it with all of our might. God, we pray this in your name. And everyone says, amen.